Hello, polar bears and pat foots. My name is Devious Guy, and there's been a couple of interesting new lore updates to the League of Legends universe arriving in the form of a bio and short story update for Lissandra and for Velkaz. Now, um, Lissandra, I think, is getting an update because Nunu is coming out, and Nunu has a bunch of lore um, that relates to Lissandra, relates to the Frost Guard, and so Lissandra has kind of needed some updates to her old lore in order to kind of, you know, keep up with the changes that have been happening. Velkos, in turn, has received a lore update that expands a lot on the role of the Void, and what the Void is, and what the Void wants, and I think that's in in order to accommodate Lysandra's expanded lore and her expanded relationship with the Void itself. And the end result of this is uh, a new bio for Lysandra substantially expanding upon her past and her motivations, as well as a 35-minute absolutely massive short story called The Eye in the Abyss, which we will not be tackling over the course of this video because, frankly, there's way too much of it. Now, there's a link to it down in the description. I recommend that you go and read it because this is actually really quite a good one. But I figure I'm going to do a separate video where I tackle this short story specifically and do kind of like an old school nitpicky going reading through the story and commenting on it as we go kind of thing. Because it's been a while since I've done one of those and I kind of miss it. As for Velkos, he's received also a new very expanded um, bio as well as a little bit of a short story. This is a video that's going to be relevant later. Um, that sort of explores what Velkaz does in the League of Legends universe. Now, we are going to be tackling this short story because it's a five-minute read and really there really isn't that much information in it compared to the Lysandra short story. So, Lysandra's old lore positions her kind of as a villain, as evil. Like, she, she, she's the evil Ice Witch who's kind of hanging out in the background of the Freljord and doing evil Ice Witch stuff. But we don't really have a, a substantial amount of backstory on her or any substantial motivation for why she behaves the way she behaves. All there really is is, centuries ago, Lysandra betrayed her tribe to evil creatures known as Frozen Watchers in return for power. And then she tries to take over the world, and then that fails, and then she's like, okay, I can't take over the world right now, so I will fade into the background, and I will, like, I'll, she takes over different bodies in order to impersonate political and important influential diplomatic leaders and eventually managed to corrupt the Frostguard tribe to worshipping the Void the same way that she does, and now she's just kind of waiting in the background, restoring herself every once in a while, faking her own death and reappearing, uh, while she's waiting for another opportunity to take over the world, and that's... that's about it. Like, she's Skeletor. Like, there's, there's really not... She's, she's like evil Ice Witch Skeletor, so lurking in the background, waiting for an opportunity to seize power. New Lysandra lore, however, expands a lot on who she is as a person, why she has made the choices that she's made, and why um, she's behaving the way that she's behaving. So, in a time long forgotten before the sands birthed and then swallowed Sharima, beings of old magic freely walked Rune Terra. The borders between the mortal realm and what lay beyond it were hotly contested. Into this dangerous and volatile age, Lysandra and her sisters Cyrilda and Avarosa were born. Each sought to harness the powers at war, and each paid a terrible price. Attempting to command the heavens above them, Cyrilda lost her voice to the first twilight. Avarosa faced the twisting dark beneath the world and was deafened by its emptiness, waiting to consume all creation. It was Lysandra who stood against the wild magic of the mortal world itself. For this defiance, the savage claws of a primal god raked across her eyes, blinding her. That may have been uh, Volibear, you know, primal god, savage claws, or it could also be Anivia, uh, possibly, it's not really known. Doesn't matter that much. Though each sister had lost part of themselves, it was on the frozen fields of Lysandra's many battles that they were able to unite and prevail. But together, they were unstoppable. But even a bond of blood could only weather so much. With her sight taken, Lysandra chose instead to walk in dreams. As she navigated the fitful visions of those around her, she realized only she could see the darkness below for what it was. The lingering abyss promised not only an ending, but infinity. It was death, both dangerous and full of potential. Unknown to her sisters, Lysandra struck a deal on their behalf with the godlike entities she had communed with. The Watchers would grant them near immortality in, in, in exchange for preparing Runeterra for the coming of the Void. The three sisters and their most powerful followers were named Iceborn. Those with this ability to withstand the worst of the numbing frost would be spared until the very end. However, Lysandra's sisters grew displeased. Avarosa argued that the only thing worse than death was servitude. Even Cyrilda bristled against what would become of the world they had fought so hard for. 
Caught in the middle, Lysandra tried to soothe her sister's concerns while appealing to the Watchers for more time, but the unknowable nothingness cared not for such platitudes. And so, the Void attacks Rune Terra, and Lysandra is kind of trapped because she loves her sister, she cares for them, but she's also, she also knows that the Void cannot be stopped. She has decided that the Void will inevitably take over the world. And so what she does is she sacrifices her sisters and all the allies that they had gathered to entomb the Watchers beneath a glacial barrier of magical ice that could never be melted. True ice, in other words. Unfortunately, it's not enough. The Watchers are only trapped, and they begin to corrupt the ice and try to melt it and try to escape and try to re-engage their campaign to destroy Rune Terra. And so Lysandra is caught in a little bit of a bind here because she has survived the initial conflict, but not only has she betrayed her sisters, she has betrayed the Void as well. And so we're not quite sure what Lysandra wants. It's not really um, expanded upon here. It's It says that... Uh, let's see... Yeah, it says that uh, they, they, the Watchers wander through Lysandra's dreams as easily as she had wandered through theirs, and always she would wake terrified, professing her loyalty to the chilling eternity that they promised. But she's also trying to delay this from happening. She's been sending her followers into the Howling Abyss to check on the Watchers, to check that they are locked away safely, that they are sealed that they cannot invade the Freljord or indeed the whole of Runeterra. Now, she still believes that the Void's victory is essentially inevitable, that there's really nothing you can do about it, but she's also doing her very best to delay that time in which they will re reignite their assault on Runeterra. And that makes her kind of an interesting character because she's someone who clearly acted out of a certain kind of care for her sisters. Like she bargained with the Void in order to give her and her sisters the ability to survive for as long as possible in the face of the oncoming certainty of doom. Um, but it backfired on her and she couldn't really convince her sisters to go quietly into that good night. And now... Sichuani and Ash have appeared, leading the Frost Guard and uh, not the Frost Guard, the Winter's Claw and the Avarosans. And Lysandra is kind of like, okay, we should probably, I should probably deal with them, pre prevent them from taking over power in the Freljord because I'm the only person who knows the truth of what happened back then, and I need to keep these Watchers contained for as long as possible until they inevitably inevitably break out and doom us all. And that makes Lysandra, I think, a much more interesting, complex character than she was. She's not no longer sort of the cackling, gleeful villain just waiting for her opportunity to usher the world into doom. She is someone who's like, yeah, it's inevitable. We're all going to die. The Void is going to win. But we can at least delay it. We can at least hold on to existence for a little while longer. We can at least keep being alive for a little while longer. And that, to me, is very interesting now. Like I said, her short story doesn't really expand anything upon who she is as a character. She's not really in it. We don't really get to see um, her or what she does. We get to see something that her followers do. But my impression of her anyway is this much more gray area kind of character where it's like you understand why she's behaving the way that she does, even if it does mean that her actions are ultimately evil. It's not because she's like, meh. <laughs> I am Skeletor, I want to do evil, bad things, meh. It's more like, we're all fucked, we're all gonna fucking die, and all we can really do is just kind of try to hold on to existence for as long as humanly possible. So she is a character who kind of fits into this idea of the Void as cosmic horror. Cosmic horror often relies on the realization of humans that we are utterly insignificant in the grand scheme of things, that the universe doesn't care about us, that it is vast beyond our comprehension, and that it will destroy us in a heartbeat and not even give the slightest bit of a damn about who we are. Which leads us on to Velkos and the more complex and interesting part of this discussion, I think. Now, Velkos, uh, in his old lore conception, didn't really have much. This is it. This is, like, his lore was, he was the first Voidspawn, probably, and he's been flying around and he's been deconstructing people with lasers in order to analyze them and learn information, but that's about... That's really about all we get from him. And we also get a short story for him, um, where he just kind of flies around, I believe, the... Um, 
the uh, city where Cillian used to live, and then he kills some people and absorbs some information, and then he's like, I must absorb more information, and then, then that's kind of it. In the new lore conception, and this is where this video is going to come into play, Velkaz has a lore update that expands substantially on the lore itself. As it says, to truly understand the horror that is Velkaz, one must first know of the Watchers and how they were blinded to the mortal realm. So, beyond the material plane, outside and somehow below it, lies the unknowable abyss. It is the realm of the void, where no mortal or immortal creature may ever walk. It is not necessary to know how such a plane place ever came to be, nor why, only that it did. The void is eternal. The void consumes all. In that place, in the cold, endless dark, all is equal and empty. For timeless eons, there was purity in that fact. There was peace, if such a term could have any meaning there. Then something changed, not in the void realm, but elsewhere. It was existence, it was something, where before there had been nothing and its mere presence scraped against the vast, cold, formless entities that drifted in the blackness. Before this, they had not even been fully aware of their own sentience. And yet now they knew that they could not tolerate the presence of this other place, this other realm of mercurial, overwhelming creation. The entities watched, they scrutinized, and soon enough, the Watchers found themselves being scrutinized in return. The tiny mortal minds that reached out to them were insignificant, little more than fleeting motes of light at the very edge of the abyss. Yet in them, the Watchers saw a chance to invade the material realm, to destroy it, to silence the intolerable pulsing of reality beyond the void. The boldest of them tore open the veil and hurled themselves upward, only to be horribly disoriented by the sudden shift between the abyss and the corporeal, linear nature of reality. In an instant, there was time and heat and pain. Then there was only cold. The way was shut, and dozens of the Watchers were trapped in the liminal space between two realms, frozen in the moment of transition. Those that remained in the void recoiled. They had no concept of what had happened, yet they knew they had been betrayed. And so, they adapted. And this is a rather expanded understanding of what the Void is from both a cosmological perspective in the League of Legends universe, but also from a thematic perspective. Now, in the old conception of the Void, it was just sort of like, the Void is this horrible other place where the, the bad things are and they want to destroy th things because. Like, they really, it was just like, the Void is the place where the space monsters come from. And its existence, like, its conceptual space within the creation myth of the League of Legends universe was not very well explained. But now it does have a theme. As it says, something changed, not in the Void Realm, but elsewhere. It was existence, it was something where before there had been nothing, and its mere existence scraped against the vast, cold, formless entities that drifted in the blackness. Before this, they had not even been fully aware of their own sentience, and yet now they knew they could not tolerate the presence of this other place, this other realm of mercurial, overwhelming creation. So, the void is this thing that has always been there, that has always existed. It is eternal, and it is equal. In the cold, endless dark, all is equal and empty. It's just this flat, empty, heat death of the universe kind of nothingness, where there is no individuality, there is no existence, there is no anything. And there is so little anything in there, there is in fact nothing in there, and so the entities, the consciousnesses that exist in the void aren't conscious. They are not really sentient because they don't have any conception that they themselves exist until something else begins to exist. Until creation happens, until the physical realm begins to exist, begins to prod at them, begins to make them aware of their own consciousness, they don't become sentient. But once the the reality of Rune Terra begins to exist, it becomes this itch, this scratching, this intolerable thing that exists when it shouldn't. Like, to, to the mind of the creatures in the void, reality shouldn't exist. It shouldn't be there because it is different. It is other. It is something other than themselves. It is something other than the void, and they cannot take it. They can't stand it. They can't bear the fact that it is there. And um, this is where 
that other video I've been scrolling past a couple of times is going to come into play. I'm going to shut up. I'm going to let this play. There's going to be a link to the full video down the in the description. You should go and watch it because it's quite good. But it deals with a subject that whew, is interesting in relationship to the nature of the void, but which I don't, I'm not going to pretend to fully understand myself. What are you? You're like me. But you aren't me. What are you? An object? An animal? Are you looking at me? Wait. If you're looking at me, then there's a me. I exist. And you exist. But if there's a me, then there's a you. Then that means there is a not me. Something exists that is the negation of myself. An other. Every time I see you, I'm reminded of my negation. And if there's more than one being like me, then at the end of the day, what's left for me to be? I'll kill you! But if I kill you, then you won't be there to look at me. And if you're not there to look at me, how will I know I'm here? I can't kill you, but I can make your life miserable. It's a stalemate. But never forget, I could kill you any time. From now on, my self-consciousness is rooted in being better than you, being able to destroy you at any moment and replace you with someone who looks identical. You exist to serve me by reinforcing my conception of myself. That's what makes me the master and you the slave. But wait, I could never get rid of you. You'll always be there, reminding me of my negation with your otherness. Your whole presence is a totalizing violence to me. I need you, I need you to recognize me, but even if you do, I hate you so much your recognition isn't satisfying. My whole identity is built around dominating you. I need you, but you don't need me anymore. Part two. What the hell was that? Yeah. What the hell was that indeed? This is an intro to Hegelian philosophy, a subject I will not even begin to pretend that I truly understand. And indeed, very few people do. If there are any philosophy majors, by the way, in the comments or in in uh, in just watching this video, I welcome you to go into the comments and correct me or offer your own thoughts on what I'm about to say. But the reason I brought that video, I played that extended little clip, is because when I read this story. This is what I'm reminded of. In Hegelian, the, in the Hegelian master-slave dialectic, you can only exist as a consciousness when you have an other who can look at you in order to let you know that there is something that is not you, right? If, in order for there to be a you, there has to be something not you. Because if there isn't something to define yourself against, then everything is just the same, and there's no reason to be conscious because nothing needs you to be conscious in order to observe it is a very convoluted and probably deeply insufficient and probably also wrong summation of sort of the Hegelian concept that we just saw. Again, go watch the Philosophy Tube video. It explains everything in a substantially larger amount of detail than I can do in this video. But the reason I bring it up, the reason why it's, it's on my mind and why I think it's relevant is because that kind of seems to be the thing that this conception of the void is reaching for. In that place, in the cold, endless dark, all is equal and empty. For timeless eons, there was purity in that fact. There was peace, if such a term could have any meaning there. Then something changed. It was existence. It was something where before there had been nothing. And its mere presence scraped against the vast, cold, formless entities that drifted in the blackness. Before this, they had not even been fully aware of their own sentience. And yet now, they knew that they could not tolerate the presence of this other place. This other realm of mercurial, overwhelming creation. And so what it seems to be is that the writers at Riot are reaching for some Hegelian philosophical themes in order to explain what the void is and why it wants to destroy Rune Terra. It wants to destroy Rune Terra because by simply existing, it represents a violence, a, a challenge, a destruction of what they understand themselves to be. They understand themselves to be the void, to be nothingness, to be the same eternal everything that exists everywhere and where nothing else is real, nothing else exists. But the moment Rune Terra, the physical realm, exists, these entities can no longer hold on to that previous self-conception. They are forced 
into consciousness, into sentience. They are forced to exist. They are forced to think. They are forced to be. And that hurts them, essentially. Like The mere presence of the something scrapes against them. And they could not tolerate the presence of this other place, this other realm of mercurial, overwhelming creation. This otherness, this changeability, this weirdness is painful to them. But it's also the only thing that has brought them into existence. And we get this as well. As soon enough, the Watchers found themselves being scrutinized in return, right? And they begin to use these mortal minds as a means to invade Rune Terra and try to destroy it, to get rid of it, to silence the intolerable pulsing of reality beyond the void. So in order to do this, they take from the crude matter that comprised it, shaping, corrupting, and imbuing it with consciousness. And these constructs, made of stuff from the physical realm, were the first of the Voidborn, and would be their master's eyes and ears, sent forth into the nightmare of existence to watch, listen, and learn. Among them, one stands apart, as perhaps the oldest surviving Voidborn, certainly the existing the longest outside of the Abyss, he has been known by countless names by those unfortunate enough to encounter him. Thousands of years before Ikathia unleashed the Void in battle, the primitive cultures of Shirima feared the devil Velkos, who crept forth in from the underworld to steal the dreams of wiser men. His insatiable hunger for knowledge has led Velkos across the world to its highest peaks and darkest depths. Cunning and methodical, he has quietly watched entire civilizations rise, stagnate, and decay, spent centuries combing the ocean floor for its secrets, even scrying the movements of the stars and the heavens above him. He carries all of this knowledge back to the great rifts in the fabric of Runeterra so that the Watchers might know what he knows, and will annihilate without hesitation any mortal who stands in his path, for the Void is eternal and it will consume us all. So, Velkaz's role, his existence, is to gather information, knowledge about existence, about this other place who, which is so intolerable to the Void. And it demonstrates something about the Void, that not only is the Void desperate to destroy Runeterra, it's also desperate to understand it. It's desperate to know it. It's desperate to retain something of it, even if that is only information in their endless quest to destroy it. And that to me, in relation to the Hegelian philosophy, as we discussed, is quite fascinating because it opens the possibility, or at least I think so, that in the future, well, what if the Void manages to destroy Rune Terra? What would happen if they did? What would happen if they did manage to snuff out existence? Could they just go back to being nothing? To being formless consciousness as drifting in the eternity of the void without sentience, without knowledge, without being, without understanding that there is something other than themselves. And that's where I get a little bit curious about Riot's plans for the void, because what if some of the Voidborn decide that they don't want to do that? What if someone like Kasix decides that he's not done evolving, that he's not done hunting, eating, existing, being part of the world? What if someone like Velkos decides that he doesn't know enough yet, that he hasn't finished his mission to know everything about the physical realm? What if someone like Cho'Gath decides that he wants to keep consuming? What happens then? What happens if the Watchers, without something else to hate and destroy, are suddenly forced to turn on each other. What happens if a Watcher decides that even though he hates the world, even though he hates Rune Terror, he hates what it does, he hates the existence of the physical realm, he can't destroy it because they need it. They need it to remind them who they are, that they exist at all. They need it to have their identities, their consciousnesses, their knowledge is dependent on the physical realm. What then? This, and I know this is like kind of a lot to go into from a simple character bio, but for me at least that seems to be the theme that Riot are kind of hinting at, that there is a relationship between the Void and Rune Terra that isn't just one way. It's not just that the Void wants to destroy Rune Terra. Rune Terra is also influencing the Void. It is changing it. It is causing it to have properties and qualities and consciousnesses and existences that weren't there before. The relationship is mutual. There is a dialectic 
between the existence of Runeterra and the consciousness of the Void. Are they going to go with any of this? Are they ever going to develop any of this? Is this really a theme that they are interested in exploring at all? I have no idea, but it's an interesting reading. I think it's a really interesting interpretation of what's going on here that could lead to some really interesting storytelling when we have characters in League of Legends who need to deal with the Void and the consciousnesses that exist there. How does that relationship take place? How does that interaction take place? For Rise, it's just like, holy shit, blow it the fuck up. That was kind of his only his only available choice. But for someone like Lissandra, who is desperately pushing the Void to delay, to hold off on destroying Terra, to wait just one second longer, just leave existence alive just a little bit longer, just a little bit longer. That's all she wants, is to exist for just a little bit longer before the inevitable end. There's some stories to be told there. There's some interesting stories to explore. I don't know if they're gonna, but I hope so. Anyway, Welkaz also has a uh, color story to himself, and it primarily takes place through the um, the eyes of a Togo Togogolian, I believe, um, a, a person who lives in a nation that shares borders with Noxus, and who's just who's a soldier, and he's out on a patrol, and he comes to a village, and he finds that everybody in the village has had their left eye taken from them, alongside apparently their consciousness and their ability to think. And first they think it's Noxians who have attacked the village, but then they find that, oh boy, it's a void entity, it's Vel'Koz, and he steals their eyes, and at the moment when our protagonist, the first person narrator who was talking, becomes devoured by Vel'Koz, becomes deconstructed into knowledge, we see things from Vel'Koz's perspective. As I work, the analysis can inflict physical pain, should I desire it. But that is not critical here. I have learned much of pain and its uses. This one's information is precious, as all knowledge is. A settlement, interactions, castes, a particular female of the species, an offspring. This one resists my analysis of those, but it is a simple thing to overcome. With nothing more to consume, I travel here to disseminate what I have collected. The rift beneath me is a conduit for information to be passed into the true realm. The creatures that inhabit this world have been have designated our domain as the void. Such cru cu curious poetry these entities weaves, a curiosity that illustrates how far my task is from completion. A universe of knowledge surrounds me, of great power in distant lands, and I shall collect it all. I offer this information now, and all of the rest to come. Accept, consume, learn. This is Velkos's perspective, which is part of what makes me think that in the future, maybe, a way that you could go with Vel'Koz is one where he decides to delay the coming of the Void, where he decides to not let his masters just roam rampant over Rune Terra and destroy it, because a universe of knowledge surrounds me of great power in distant lands, and I shall collect it all. Such curious poetry these entities weaves weave a curious a curiosity that illustrates how far my task is from completion and by the way Velkos has been around since before Shirima since before pretty much everything he's he was one of the first void entities to be created at all in Runeterra and he his takeaway from existing on Runeterra for thousands upon thousands of years is I'm not done. I'm not done yet. I'm not. There's still more. There's still more I need to know. I need to understand. And that's kind of what got me into this this headspace of thinking about the relationship between the Void and Runeterra in terms of the Hegelian master slave dialectic, and also in terms of this thing where the Void might not be as eternal and unchangeable as it likes to believe. Anyway. I'm going to do a video um, examining in detail The Eye in the Abyss by Anthony Reynolds, the latest short story for Lissandra. Uh, that's going to be later. For now, I feel like I've talked a lot and talked enough about Hegelian philosophy, Lissandra, the Void, the Voidborn, the Frostborn, the Iceborn, the Avarosans, the Winter's Claw, Sichuani Ash, and Velkaz and stuff. And this video should be over now. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. I'm a little bit loopy and tired, in case you can't tell, because it's 3.46 a.m. right now, and I've had kind of a busy day. If you've liked this video, there's a like button down below. If you've not liked this video, there's a dislike button, which, um, probably, probably, probably 
isn't the seal over some horrific ancient evil that will reach out with tendrils and consume you for information the moment that you touch it and pass your fragmented remains of consciousness back to their eternal unceasing masters beyond the veil of reality. That is probably, probably, probably not going to happen. If you have enjoyed this video, you can also subscribe to the channel. There is a bell icon next to the subscribe button that lets you actually see the videos when you, instead of not seeing them when YouTube decides not to show them to you for unspecified and unknowable reasons. YouTube is, in fact, a lot like the void. It is this vast, unknowable algorithmic consciousness that we cannot hope to challenge and understand. We can only hope to appease it so that it lets us exist for another fleeting moment. If uh, you want to help me stave off the inevitability of death and destruction in uh, the cold coming of the void that will consume us all, well, I do have a Patreon where if you have a dollar that you don't need and you don't mind me using that dollar to feed myself and, and pay rent and stuff, then I, I will be very grateful um, to receive your help. If you're not able to do that, of course, don't worry about it. Finally, as a little bit of a final housekeeping, the second episode of my podcast with Scarus Art came out today and it is on my channel. There's going to be a link to that popping up on the screen in just a moment. And if you want to listen to me talk to a guy about like video games and like uh, how like th th this thing where uh, parents were coaching, they're uh, hiring coaches to coach their kids in Fortnite to make them good at Fortnite and how mental health is portrayed in video games and other interesting topics like that. Well, you can click on that video once it comes up and I'm thinking. I'm going to forcibly punch myself in the face uh, to make me stop rambling. So uh, thank you very much for watching. 